there is a concept of the common good that's relentlessly driven into our heads, uh, and it demands that we focus only on private gain and suppress normal human emotions of solidarity, uh, mutual support, uh, care about others. So therefore we should be opposed to acting collectively, which is what taxes are, to make sure that everybody's okay. And we should just ask, how am I making out? Uh, what happens to other people is none of my business. Uh, actually, I think that's what lies behind the assault on public education as well, and also on social security. There's a lot of lying that goes on. Uh, read it in editorials and the newspapers and daily about the costs of social security uh, and the way it's contributing to the deficit. Absolutely contributes zero to the deficit. It pays for itself. Uh, but uh, there's a massive campaign, has been for years, to get rid of Social Security, a business-run campaign, put billions of dollars into it, and also to undermine the public education system by privatizing it in various ways and other devices. Uh, it's interesting to ask what lies behind all of this. I mean, there are pretexts given, I, pretexts about costs and so on, they can't be sustained. And it's also against strong public opposition but it continues very incessantly and massively. But my suspicion is that uh, the public education system, like national health care, like social security, are based on a different conception of the common good. They're based on a conception that we care for other people. So social security is based on the idea that, say, I should care, even though you know, I don't need it, got a nice pension, I should care about a disabled widow across town who doesn't have food to eat, uh, or even though I don't have kids in school, uh, I should care whether the kids across the street go to school. Uh, those are a dangerous thought. I should care about uh, tens of millions of people dying every year because they can't get medical care. That's not supposed to be my business. I can get medical care. Uh, uh, I should care about uh, dying infants because of the very high infant mortality rate and other people who are vulnerable. That's a bad, a dangerous conception. It means you should be kind of a human being, you know, not a pathological creature who's concerned to amass private gain, period. Uh, well, these conflicts uh, go far back in American history. And it's interesting to take a look at them right through history. It's particularly useful to look back to the origins of the Industrial Revolution, mid-19th century. That's when the country was undergoing enormous changes, uh, as uh, uh, social changes of all kinds, as the population was being, it had been a pretty much a population of independent farmers. Uh, and people were being driven into the industrial system. <clears throat> uh, and working people, knew about, wrote about it. They weren't silent. Big working class literature is quite interesting. Uh, working people bitterly condemned the industrial system because it deprived them of their basic rights as free men and women. And incidentally, not least women. Uh, there was a group called Factory Girls, young women from the farms who driven into the textile mills uh, who contributed uh, very uh, extensively to the literature of protest and analysis. You can find it if you search for it. And it's worth reading <clears throat> the contributions of the vigorous press of that day. I think it's the freest press in American history uh, by factory girls, uh, artisans from, say, Boston, uh, others. And uh, actually, it's important also as a background matter to bear in mind that a working class culture at the time was very much alive and flourishing. Actually, there's a great book about this, by, about England, by Jonathan Rose. It's called The Intellectual Life of the British Working Class. It's actually a monumental study that, of the reading habits of uh, the British working class of that day. That's the working class of Dickensian and 
England, not very attractive. Uh, he con I'll quote him. He contrasts the passionate pursuit of knowledge by proletarian autodidacts with the pervasive Philistinism of the British aristocracy. And it was pretty much the same uh, uh, here, here too in eastern, northeastern working class towns, for example, eastern Massachusetts, uh, uh, in, in, around there, and say in Boston, an Irish blacksmith, uh, if he could make enough money, would typically hire a young boy to read to him uh, from classics while he's working. The, the blacksmith might have been illiterate, but he wanted it read to him. Uh, this, uh, uh, you take a look at the factory girls, what they were reading. Uh, they were reading the best contemporary literature of the time, what we now study as classics. Uh, they condemned the industrial system for depriving them of their freedom and their culture. And this went on for a long time. I'm old enough to remember the last stages of it, 1930s. A uh, large part of my family was uh, working class, most of them unemployed at the time. Uh, a lot of them had, had very little formal schooling, a couple of years of school. Uh, but they were uh, part of the high culture of the age. I mean, they'd go to Shakespearean plays, talk about the latest concert of the Budapest String Quartet. They studied, uh, they discussed the fashionable ideas and conflicts in psychoanalysis and uh, every uh, political uh, movement that you can think of. There was also a very lively workers' education system, uh, leading, uh, largely union-based, uh, leading a lot of leading scientists and mathematicians were directly involved, writing books on popular si on science and mathematics, intended and teaching classes, intended for working class audiences who were uh, eating it up. Now, a lot of this has been lost <clears throat> under the relentless assault of the masters of mankind, but it can be recovered, and I don't think it's lost forever. Well, the labor press of the 19th century uh, took strong positions on many issues that should have a resonance today. They took for granted, for example, quote them, that those who work in the mills ought to own them. They, we don't want bosses, we can do it ourselves. Uh, they condemned wage labor, which they regarded as not very different from chattel slavery different only in that it was supposedly temporary. Actually, that was such a popular view in the United States that it was a part of the program of the Republican Party in the mid-19th century. It was also a main theme of the organized labor movement that was taking shape, uh, the Knights of Labor, very important movement, uh, which began to est establish relations, link up uh, with another major popular movement, uh, Farmers Alliance, uh, and it was initiated by radical farmers in Texas and then spread throughout the agricultural society. Uh, it's later called the populist movement. It formed uh, collective enterprises, uh, banks, uh, marketing cooperatives, a lot more. It would have driven the country's most important democratic movie, movement in the country's history and would have driven the country towards a much more democratic society, uh, more authentic democracy, if it hadn't been destroyed, uh, largely by violence, as the Knights of Labor were. We have a very violent labor history, much more so than comparable countries. One of the reflections of the unusual power of the business classes in the United States as compared with other, uh, other countries. Although uh, it's interesting to bear in mind that similar developments are underway now in the old Rust Belt, northern Ohio and elsewhere, uh, which could be very important for the future, I think. The prime target of condemnation in the labor press was what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth forgetting all but self. This is 160 years ago. Uh, 
uh, no efforts have been spared since then to drive the new spirit of the age into people's heads. Uh, what I've started talking about is a current example of that. People just have to come to believe that suffering and deprivation result from individual failure, uh, not from the reigning socioeconomic system. I'm sure you've heard plenty of this all your lives. Uh, there are huge industries devoted to this task. Uh, about a sixth of the entire U.S. economy is uh, devoted to what's called marketing. Uh, marketing is mostly propaganda. Uh, analysts, and in fact the business literature itself, uh, uh, describe it as a process of fabricating wants uh, to drive people to the superficial things of life like fashionable consumption, and to impose the right attitudes of subordination and obedience on the population. So they'll remain passive and obedient and let us run things by ourselves. Uh, the schools are a natural target for this. As I mentioned, uh, mass public education was a major achievement in the United States. The US led the way in very important development was a pioneer, but it had quite complex characteristics which were rooted in the class conflicts of the day. That's 19th century. So one goal of mass public education was to induce independent farmers to give up their independence and submit themselves to industrial discipline and to accept what they regarded as slavery, wage slavery, temporary, essentially slavery. That's not easy to do. That was a major goal of the public education system. That did not pass without notice, of course. Uh, so uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he observed that political leaders of his day were calling for mass public education, and he concluded that their motivation was fear he said the country was filling up with millions of voters. Popular struggles were gaining a lot of freedom. And the masters realized, as he put it, that we have to educate them to keep them from our throats. That means a particular kind of education. Educate them the right way so they'll be obedient, passive, accept their fate as right and just, and will continue to rule, drive into them the new spirit of the age, uh, keep their perspectives narrow, their understanding limited, discourage free and independent thought, which is dangerous, uh, instill docility and obedience to keep them from the master's throats. That's a common theme from 150 years ago, long time, still goes on right in front of our eyes. It's inhuman, it's savage, uh, has some effects, and it also meets with resistance. And there have been victories in the resistance. The struggles of the 1930s, for example, were considerable victories. Uh, carried further in the 1960s, uh, it had a big civilizing effect on the society, and therefore is called the time of troubles. It's the standard term for it. It's made people too civilized. Uh, but uh, systems of power, which incidentally includes a good deal of the intellectual community, uh, they don't walk away politely. Uh, they are constantly engaged in uh, intensive, self-conscious class struggle. Uh, and as soon as there's some victories for freedom, they immediately prepare a new assault. And that's in fact been happening since the 19, late 1970s, that's what we're living in now. Uh, the, was based on major changes in the design of the economic system. The term design is appropriate, there were alternatives to how to react to the problems of the day. But the way it was designed, in the interests of the masters of course, uh, were, involved two fundamental changes in the late 70s. Uh, one of them was financialization of the economy. So if you say go back to the 
big growth periods, huge growth periods of the 50s and the 60s. Also, egalitarian growth, poor sector had about as much advance as the richest sector. Uh, there was a financial system, of course, uh, but there, was, there wasn't interstate banking. There weren't huge financial corporations. The banks were essentially what banks are supposed to be in a state capitalist system like ours. If you have some, some excess money put into the bank, uh, they, the bank lends it out usually to somebody local who wants to do something constructive, uh, buy a house, uh, send the kids to college, you know, buy a car, whatever it may be. That's a bank, but not anymore. That was prior to the 1970s. Uh, uh, now there's uh, a, the change led to a huge explosion in the scale of financial institutions are of a totally different character. And by 2007, uh, at a point where the financial institutions brought about, they cause it, the latest of the regular financial crises that have been coming since the early 80s, since Reagan. Uh, when they brought about the latest of them, they actually had about 40% of corporate profits, which is extraordinary. Uh, also, it led to a huge explosion of speculative financial flows, uh, which did nothing for the economy. They probably harm it. Uh, but uh, that's one major change. Uh, parallel to that, accompanying it, was deindustrialization. Now, that doesn't mean that production uh, ceased. It means it was sent overseas. Uh, of course, that had always happened to an extent, uh, but there was a massive increase in it starting in the late 1970s. Uh, send production overseas to northern Mexico, to southeastern China, to Bangladesh, uh, wherever you can uh, get terrible working conditions and no environmental constraints. Uh, so that leads to uh, uh, high profits uh, for the masters, not for the people here who don't have jobs. Uh, within the United States, uh, it set off a, a vicious cycle leading to a very sharp concentration of wealth. As I'm sure you know by now, wealth concentration is way far different from other industrial countries and back to the most extreme days of American history. Uh, concentration of wealth leads almost reflexively to concentration of political power, all sorts of ways. Uh, that leads to legislation, which carries the vicious cycle forward. Uh, so sharp cutbacks in taxation for the rich, uh, corporate taxes way below what it was in the periods of great economic growth or elsewhere, uh, deregulation, which escalates the financial crises. Ever since the period of deregulation, there have been regular financial crises. There were none in earlier years when New Deal regulations were in place. Uh, other uh, changes in the rules of corporate governance, which have effectively allow uh, CEOs to s essentially to determine their own salaries and bonuses. They can pick the boards, which set the salaries and bonuses, and a whole uh, series of other uh, uh, changes. Uh, the, uh, 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 as I said, it, it does lead to repeated financial crises, and these are not a surprise. They're built into the new system. And it's understood that we're now in the latest of the financial crises, the worst of all of them so far, and others are pretty likely to come. Uh, the direct, one of the directors of the Bank of England, a very conservative economist, calls it a doom loop. It's built into the structure of the system that we have to have repeated financial crises, uh, each one worse than the last. I could talk about it. Now, for the masters, this is no problem at all. Uh, uh, actually, there are solutions, uh, but uh, uh, the people who run the place don't want the solutions. And for them, it's no problem, because they get bailed out. Uh, they want a powerful state, nanny state, which works for them. And it does. So they get paid off. Uh, right now, after having created the last financial crisis, the corporate profits are breaking new records. Uh, the financial managers who 
created the current crisis are enjoying huge bonuses. For them, everything is great. Populations suffering, but that's not their business. Uh, meanwhile, throughout this period, for the large majority of the population, uh, wages and incomes have practically stagnated in the last 30 odd years. Uh, by now, it's actually reached the point that 400 individuals in the United States have more wealth than the bottom 180 million Americans. That's extremely sharp maldistribution. Well, in parallel to all of this, the cost of elections has skyrocketed. That has an effect. It drives both parties uh, even deeper uh, into the pockets of those who have the wealth, uh, people of extreme wealth and the corporate sector. Uh, that, that has an effect too, whether you win the election or you lose it. it means that uh, political leaders are more and more beholden to those who buy their, uh, buy their victory for them, or pay for them, and have to be around next time they run. You've got to do what they say. Uh, there's a, a, con a consequence of this, which is actually pretty well studied in the professional political science literature. Uh, the United States is a very heavily polled society, uh, good polls, so we know quite a lot about what people think and believe and want. And there are studies, good studies, that compare people's attitudes and beliefs with actual policy. That's where the results come on divergence between the two. And the studies show that about 70% of the population, that's the lowest 70% in, uh, in income and wealth, have literally no influence on policy. It makes no difference what they think. They're disenfranchised. Uh, as you move up the wealth and income level, you get slowly you get a little bit more influence. When you get to the very top, uh, a very small group, people essentially get what they want, what they paid for, what they want. Now that's the current political system. Uh, well, let's turn to the assault on education. It's one element of the general elite reaction to the civilizing effect of the 60s. And there's, a, as always, something on the right and something on what they call the left. On the right side of the political spectrum, one of the most useful things to look at is a very influential memorandum. It was written by Lewis Powell, a corporate lawyer who was working for the tobacco industry. Uh, he was later appointed to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon. At the other end of the spectrum, pretty narrow spectrum, uh, there was an important study by the Trilateral Commission Trilateral Commission is liberal internationalists from the three major state capitalist industrial systems, uh, US, Europe, and Japan. Its uh, political character is pretty well uh, demonstrated by the fact that the Carter administration was completely drawn from its ranks. Uh, both of these, from you know, the ends of the mainstream spectrum, provide good insight into why the assault targets the educational system, and I'd urge you to look at them. Well, let's start with the Powell Memorandum from the right. It has a title. The title is The Attack on the American Free Enterprise System. And it's interesting to read, not only for the content, but also for the style, the very paranoid tone. Uh, and that's not unusual for those who take it for granted that they have the right to rule, if anything gets out of control, it's a tragedy, like a spoiled three-year-old who expects that they're supposed to have everything and they're not something, they couldn't get a thousand dollar toy. Uh, so the rhetoric tends to be inflated and paranoid, pretty common in the business literature. Well, Powell identifies the leading criminals who are destroying the American way of life. Uh, one of them is Ralph Nader with his consumer safety campaigns. Uh, the other was Herbert Marcuse, you know, major dominant figure in American life. Uh, he was uh, preaching Marxism to the young new leftists who were on the rampage uh, all over the country. 
uh, well, they're what he calls their naive victims, dominated the universities and the schools, controlled television and other media, controlled the educated community, and controlled virtually the entire government. Actually, if, if you think I'm exaggerating, I would really urge you to read it for yourselves. Uh, well, this total takeover of the country by these crazed Marxists was uh, a dire threat to freedom, he said. And he drew the obvious conclusion, I'll quote it. The campuses from which much of this criticism emanates are supported by tax funds generated largely from American business, contributions from capital funds controlled or generated by American business, the boards of trustees at universities are overwhelmingly composed of uh, men and women who are leaders in the business system, and most of the media, including the national TV systems, are owned and theoretically controlled by corporations uh, which depend on profits and the enterprise system in which they survive. So therefore, the oppressed business people who have practically no influence on American life uh, should organize and defend themselves instead of idly sitting by while our fundamental freedoms are being uh, destroyed by the Marxist onslaught led by Herbert Marcuse and Ralph Nader. Uh, those are the expressions of the concerns that the, by, elicited by 60s activism at the right end of the political spectrum. Actually, much more revealing, in my opinion, is the reaction from the opposite extreme, of the liberal internationalists, Carter-style liberals. They perceived, uh, they have a study called The Crisis of Democracy, it came out in the mid-70s, uh, and they perceived a crisis, and they're very open and frank about it. The crisis was that in the 60s, there was too much democracy. The system used to work fine, they said, when most of the population was silent, apathetic, passive, and obedient. Uh, the American contributor, Samuel, professor at Harvard, Samuel Huntington, uh, he looked back with nostalgia at uh, the good old days, quoting him, when Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers so that then democracy flourished with no crisis. Uh, but in the 60s, something kind of dangerous happened. Special interest groups uh, began to try to enter the political arena and press for their demands. And they identify the special interests, uh, women, minorities, young people, old people, farmers, uh, laborers, actually the population. They're the special interests. Uh, and they're supposed to sit obediently and watch while the intelligent minority uh, run things, of course, in the interests of everyone. That's actually according to liberal democratic theory, if you bother reading it. Uh, the, actually, there's one group that they omit when they talk about the various interests. It's the corporate sector. And that makes sense. They don't comprise a special interest. They're the national interest. Uh, so therefore, their dominant role in what we call democracy is right and proper, and you don't have to have any comment about it. Now, the trilateral scholars, very much like Lewis Powell, were very concerned about the educational system. Quote them. They were responsible for the failure of the institutions, responsible for the indoctrination of the young. That's what the schools, the universities, and the churches are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to indoctrinate you, uh, much like what Ralph Waldo Emerson was talking about. And they were failing. You could see that they were failing uh, because of these uprisings in the streets and the efforts of the special interests to enter the political arena, other dangerous phenomena. So therefore, the trilateral scholars called for more moderation in democracy. People should become passive and apathetic again and more effective indoctrination of the young if our freedom is to be preserved. Well, those are the bounds. Those are the left-right bounds. And within those bounds, uh, 
current assault on the public education system takes off in order to restore order, passivity, and indoctrination. Uh, uh, I'll give a couple of examples, some of them anecdotal, personal. So a couple of years ago it happens that I, uh, I was invited to give talks at uh, the National University in Mexico. It's quite a good university. It's free. Uh, some years ago, the government tried to raise, to, to institute small costs. There was a national student strike, practically closed the country down. The government backed off. It remains free. Actually, students are still occupying one of the administration buildings, which is used as a community center. This was about 15 years ago. Actually, something similar it just happened in Quebec in the last couple of months. It doesn't get reported here. It's too dangerous for people to know things like that. Uh, in Mexico City, at that time, there was a leftist mayor. He established a university that was not only free, but had open admissions, so anybody can go. There were remedial courses for people who didn't have the right educational background. I was there, too. It's pretty, high, pretty impressive and high level. Well, that's Mexico. It's a poor country. Uh, from Mexico, I went to California, that's, uh, to the Bay Area. That's one of the richest regions in the world, uh, where they're intent right now on destroying, very consciously destroying the public education system, uh, which was the best in the world, uh, very systematically. The major universities uh, are uh, virtually being privatized uh, for the rich. They're becoming like Ivy League universities. And uh, educational opportunities for the rest of the public system are slowly being modified uh, to provide some kind of technical training. Something similar to that is happening all over the country. By now, in most states, uh, tuition, covers, uh, tuition covers more than half of the costs for colleges. Uh, pretty soon, only the community colleges will be publicly financed under current tendencies, and even they are under attack. And uh, analysts seem to agree with this. I'll quote one, the era of affordable four-year public universities, heavily subsidized by the state, uh, may be over. And meanwhile, in private universities, costs are going out of sight. The students find themselves in a debt trap. It's now passed over a trillion dollars higher than total debt and credit cards. And student debt is designed to be exceptionally punishing. The most debt you can't get out of in the ways that are open to others for other kinds of debt, like you can't declare bankruptcy. Uh, uh, so there's no expiration debt on the debt. That means that collectors can garnish your wages for the rest of your life, unemployment benefits, social security, uh, forever. It's a very effective trap for students. It cuts down on options, uh, particularly when unemployment, when employment opportunities are reduced, so there aren't many. And that's a good technique of indoctrination. Uh, the basic idea was explained by one of the trustees of the New York State University system. He said, there's been a shift from the belief that we as a nation benefit from higher education to a belief that the people who are receiving the education are the ones who benefit, so they should foot the bill. Now that's the new spirit of the age again. Uh, he doesn't say whose belief it is, but we can figure that out. Uh, well, as usual, the primary victims are the people who are most vulnerable. Uh, in this respect, it's quite similar to subprime lending goes after the vulnerable people. There's an educational analog, that's the colleges for profit. They seem to offer opportunities, uh, but it turns out if you look, there have been studies that almost all students, mostly those from the less privileged classes, are plunged into debt. It's a very high default rate uh, within 10 or 15 years. And that aside, the kind of education they get is pretty thin. Uh, I'm sure you all know that successful education from K to 12 and on through research universities is very largely face-to-face -face contact among students, among students and faculty, 
as, as well, and that's all gone in those. Well, the Mexico-California comparison uh, illustrates a very general point. The reasons for the conscious destruction of the greatest public, public education system in the world are not economic. Mexico's a poor country. America's a rich country. Now, there are other rich countries, uh, Germany, Finland, some of the highest educational standards in the world. Uh, education's free. Uh, actually, the same was pretty much true of the United States when it was a much poorer country than today. So in the 1950s, during the great growth period, uh, uh, there was a program, uh, there was the GI Bill, uh, which offered free education to huge numbers of people, could never have gotten it otherwise, uh, at public expense. It was very rewarding for them, of course, and very beneficial for the country. In fact, the GI Bill was one important reason for the uh, what economists call the golden age of high growth and egalitarian growth in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, that was in a poor, much poorer country than, a, than a, we are now. Uh, there's a parallel development during the past 30 years of the general onslaught on the population at the university level. That's corporatization of the universities. Uh, so during this neoliberal period, there's been a very rapid increase in highly paid professional administrators and staff, high salaries and so on, who bring a business model to the universities. In, the er in earlier days, administration wasn't much of a big deal. A, a faculty member would take off a couple of years and be an administrator and go back to teaching. Uh, that's much less true today. Uh, there's a very good study of this, if you're interested, by a well-known sociologist, Benjamin Ginsberg. It's called The Fall of the Faculty, uh, The Rise of the All-Administrative University and Why It Matters. And it does matter. There are lots of repercussions. Uh, one is the imposition of a business model. Uh, one effect of that is a drive towards what's called efficiency, something you learn about in business school. It's an interesting concept. Efficiency is not really an economic concept. Uh, as I already mentioned, transferring costs to individuals is called efficiency, uh, only for ideological reasons. And we see that all the time. So for example, if you call up a bank or an airline or whatever to uh, say check on some error or try to find information, you all know what happens. You get a recorded message it tells you, we love you, we love your business, and hang on, uh, and you hang on. Well, music plays, and every once in a while this recorded voice comes back. And finally, at the end of it all, you, you get a menu, which has a lot of options, most of which are ones you don't want. And, it, and uh, if you really have enough patience and hang on long enough, you can actually get a human being. Well, that's, that's, that transfers, it saves the business a lot of money it transfers the cost to the individuals. Uh, and if you multiply that by the number of users, it's a pretty big cost. Well, that's, uh, for business, that increases inefficiency. The economists say, makes the country more efficient. Uh, for the consumer, it's very costly. Uh, when these costs are multiplied across the population, uh, they become quite large. There's many other illustrations. So for example, yesterday, I flew down from Boston to Philadelphia. In any other country, I would have taken a train. It would have taken less time, and less effort, but you can't do that here. Uh, you can do it from China to Kazakhstan with a high-speed rail, but not from Boston to Washington, uh, the, uh, uh, which transfers cost to individuals. But on the airlines, as most of you know, a couple of years ago, one part of the search for efficiency has been to uh, stop circulating air. It saves the airlines a little money. But of course, if you stop circulating air in the airline, it spreads diseases. Well, but that's a cost to the individual. So therefore, it doesn't count when you measure efficiency. What measures is the cost, what counts is the measure to the business. So that's more of the same phenomenon. Uh, that's another 
version of the new spirit of the age uh, built into economic doctrine. And the same kind of thing happens when corporate culture is imposed on universities. So how do you achieve efficiency in a, in a university? Well, one way is to reduce the ratio of faculty to students, meaning replace the faculty by cheap labor, what are called temp temps in the business world. Uh, uh, graduate students, for example, they're easily exploitable. They have no defense. They have no rights. They can be replaced. It's very good for the bottom line. Uh, what the administrators, professional administrators who are running the colleges uh, look for. Of course, there's harm to the students, but that's not counted because, again, if you transfer costs to people, that's not a cost. Uh, and as that trustee I quoted said, look, they're the ones who are benefiting, so they ought to pay for it. All part of the ideological character of, uh, 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 of what's called efficiency. Well, another uh, uh, strategy is eliminating programs that are too expensive. There's one recent study that shows that state colleges around the country are beginning to eliminate programs in engineering, computer science, and nursing, which happen to be the fields where there are jobs. But the courses are expensive, uh, so therefore, by good corporate logic, you should close them down. Actually, there was a special twist in Florida. The governor at one point announced that he was going to eliminate these programs at the major university. but. Uh, and meanwhile, he was increasing funding for the football team, which produces revenue and therefore serves a valid educational purpose. Well, if you want to privatize something uh, and destroy it, there's a standard method. First, defund it so that it doesn't work. And people get upset and they say, okay, let's get out of this. That's happening in the schools. Public schools are being defunded so they don't work very well, and people are willing to accept some form of privatization like charter schools, which works even less well, but you know, we'll try it. Uh, uh, there's no improvement in education, but it does help instill the new spirit of the age, and that's what counts. Uh, in the background of all of this are debates about what education ought to be. Uh, that's been a lively issue for centuries, goes back to the Enlightenment. Uh, during the Enlightenment, there was some evocative imagery to describe and contrast different concepts of the nature of education. Uh, one image of education that was used during the Enlightenment uh, was that education to be like a, a vessel into which you pour water. Uh, the, uh, uh, we've all been through that, and as you know, it's a very leaky vessel. We've all been through experiences where you got to pass an exam, and something you're not interested in, so you study hard and you pass the exam, and a week later you forgot what the course was about. Now that's one image. I'm sure you've all experienced it. Now there's another contrasting image, which in fact was the Enlightenment ideal, which said that teaching ought to be like laying out a string along which the student proceeds in his or her own way. That is, education should foster discovery, not memorizing. Uh, the of course, there's a string. The structure is designed so that the process of gaining, understanding, gathering information is a creative activity, typically carried out in association with others. That's the enlightenment ideal, and it derives from uh, much more general conceptions of human nature and uh, legitimate social relations. Uh, well, that's very much alive now. About a year ago, there was uh, the major science journal, Science Magazine, ran a series of studies by a well-known biochemist about the destruction of science education in the country through No Child Left Behind, similar programs. Gives lots of illustrations, mostly talking about the universities. And he suggests some alternatives, specific alternatives designed to instill the joy of discovery and foster creative capacity. 
starting from kindergarten up to universities. So in kindergarten, I'll just give one example. He describes a kindergarten program that was you carried out uh, uh, the kids in the kindergarten class. It started with each kid being given a dish uh, which had in it a collection of pebbles, uh, shells, and seeds. And their task was to figure out which ones were the seeds. So the first thing they did was have what they called a scientific conference. The kids got together and discussed various ways in which you could tell which ones were seeds. Now, all of this is kind of under the guidance of a teacher who you know, kind of steers things in particular directions, but the idea was to foster individual initiative, make it fun to discover. Okay, finally worked out. They finally figured out a way to test which ones were seeds. At the end of it, each kid was given a magnifying glass. Uh, the seeds were cut and the kid could look inside and see the embryo which causes it to grow. Those kids learned something. They didn't only learn biology, they learned that it's fun to discover things. It's fun to search and inquire with others and learn something. Now that's a lesson for life. Uh, well, there are plenty of other cases and it can be done at all levels and to some extent is being done from kindergarten to research universities, but it has a defect. It empowers teachers instead of humiliating them. It enriches the lives of the students, prepares them for creative, independent lives, not passive obedience. So there's a downside. Well, there are alternatives and successful models in our, our own history and elsewhere. Actually, we should be able to progress well beyond those models, but it's not gonna happen by itself. As always, it's gonna take commitment and dedicated struggle, not passive acquiescence uh, while all of this goes on before our eyes. Thanks.